chapter 11. We're going to start reading in verse 19. If you want to follow along in your Bibles, if you'd rather use your bulletin printed on the inside of your bulletin, these verses are recorded for us. This is where Dr. Luke picks up from what we've been focusing on in chapter 10 and most of chapter 11. What we've been, as a congregation, looking at the last two weeks, what happened at Cornelius's house. And he is, he's very much, if we could, if we could uh, see the overall theme here, he's very much talking about the implications of what took place at Cornelius's house. And it automatically makes me think or reminds me of the fact that, you know what, uh, you and I this week, today, we might have a conversation. And especially if it's, if it's a conversation about God. We might have a conversation with somebody, and and the conversation might go well. It might just be a normal conversation. But you know what? You have no idea what God might do with that conversation. Your D group meeting this week, it may be another typical D group meeting where, you know what? It was good to be together with other Christians, and and especially to pray for one another, maybe challenge some of our thinking. It, It may be a blessing in and of itself, but you have no idea what God might do at that meeting. There may be people that you don't even know out in the future that have been impacted in one way or another, especially when you're doing things for God. That's the very point, at least one of the points, that I think Dr. Luke, or really the Holy Spirit through Dr. Luke, is trying to remind us, us of. Listen, what happened at Cornelius' house was, was amazing, but look at the impact this had. Let, let me tell you what we're going to read before we read it, and, and hopefully... Uh, It'll make a little bit more sense when we go through these verses. He's talking about the impact of Cornelius' house. But to do that, he goes back a little bit further. He's going to mention what happened after Stephen was killed. What happened after Stephen was killed? The church started facing some persecution unlike persecution they had faced before. And it caused the church to get out. That's what God always wanted. But you know what? Sometimes it takes hardships. It takes persecution. it it, It takes stirring the pot. Well, finally, God's people start going throughout the whole world. Problem is, they're going throughout the whole world telling people about Jesus if they're Jews. Once Cornelius' house, the news of what took place at Cornelius' house gets out, now instead of just the people going throughout the world talking to Jews, now they're going throughout the whole world talking to everybody. That's what God has always wanted us to do. Here are the verses. Acts chapter 11, I want to start here in verse 19. It says, Now those who had been scattered by the persecution that broke out when Stephen was killed traveled as far as Phoenicia, Cyprus, and Antioch. He's just giving us a sampling. We're going to find out later on. They went all over the place. But they went to Phoenicia, Cyprus, and Antioch, spreading, spreading the word only among the Jews. But some of them, however, and this is where the word of Cornelius reaches people, some of them from Cyprus and Cyrene went to Antioch and began to speak to the Greeks also. Sorry, I just have to pause and say, thank you, God. <laughs> I'm so glad that the news gets out to everybody. Telling them the good news about the Lord Jesus. Verse 21, the Lord's hand was with them and a great number of the people believed and turned to the Lord. Now if you have your Bibles open, there's something else that's very interesting here. Down in verse 26, second half of the 26, it says they've got a new name for these people now. We're going to come back and talk about that in just a minute. What's going on? The message finally gets out and it gets out to everybody. Gentiles as well as Jews. What are, the, what are the places they mentioned here? The one that they focus on, and they're going to focus on this a lot more, is Antioch. Antioch was an extremely significant city in the Roman Empire. Third largest city in the Roman Empire. I don't know what you think when you think about large cities. Let me give you some perspective here. It had 15 times the population of Jerusalem. You know, too often, even if you're a history buff, too often we just think of recent history. It wasn't until the 1800s that we had three, if you call that the modern era, it wasn't until the 1800s where we had three cities that exceeded the population of one million people, Beijing, Tokyo, and London. But in the ancient world, there were huge metropolitan areas like Rome itself, well above a million people, and Antioch was probably approaching that. Huge place. Very significant place. Do you realize that they had a lighting system in ancient Antioch in the first in the first century that many historians said it looked like daylight when you went there in the middle of the night? Do you realize they had indoor plumbing? I'm getting way off subject here, but anyway, fast 
fascinating stuff, fascinating stuff in the first century. Very significant place, but probably one of the most significant things that historians have found out about Antioch, as far as you and I are concerned, is this. In the ancient world, when you wanted to build a city and you wanted it to last, you wanted to be protected, you built really big walls, right? Walls are one of the greatest things as far as first line of defense. The better the wall, the better you're protecting your city. Antioch, unlike most ancient cities, didn't just have walls on the outside. They had walls on the inside. In fact, there's this Jewish historian, his name's Josephus, and he tells us that they had as many as 19 different sections within the city that were walled off. Why? Because this ancient, huge city was unlike any other city before in that it was multi-ethnic. Most of the times, people that are alike one another speak the same language, same race. You, you develop a city. This was on a major trade route. And it brought a lot of different people who usually didn't live together before. It brought them to one city and they were living together. So why do you have all these walls inside the city? Well, one historian put it this way. He said, because even though you're trying to get along with people of, you know, different skin color, they different accents, different languages, all sorts of stuff. If somebody, if you feel like somebody shortchanged you in the marketplace, all of a sudden it's not just that person who speaks with the accent. It's all those people who speak with that accent. And that's why you had walls inside the city. So you could run and get behind your wall and... Anyway, anyway, long story short, what happens here is we have a city that brought the world together. It wasn't just a place where some Gentiles were. It was a place where you had a sampling of oh so many Gentiles all in one place. So what do we have down in verse 26? We have something extremely significant. It tells us this is the first place where God's people, followers of Christ, are called Christians. Let me try to explain at least one dimension why this is so significant. This is so significant because before this time, we get a little taste of this today. In fact, here's my, here would be my number one illustration, at least in, in my way of thinking. If you mention Hinduism today, do you usually think of maybe one ethnic group or one country? Does one country come to mind when you mention Hinduism? Sure, there are different Hindus all over the world, but usually you think of India, don't you? I mean, that's, that's like, wow. In the ancient world, most of the time, when you talked about a religion, you thought of an ethnic group. You thought of a certain group of people. And when we talked about followers of Jesus, we called them the disciples or we called them followers of the way. But up till this time, many times they would call them a sect of the Jewish people. The followers of Christ amongst the Jewish people. When the message comes to Antioch, you can't do that anymore. Why? Because it's not just the Jews, it's everybody. And that's exactly what God always wanted his people to be. It's a big, big family. The guy's name's Daryl. Daryl wrote a book this past year, and I, I personally find his writing style very engaging. And maybe, maybe it's because I can relate, at least in a little way, to some of the things he was talking about. Just some personal experiences he was sharing. He said he and his family were traveling outside the country. And when they were traveling outside the country, he said, you know, you just, he anyway, he said, I had this uneasy feeling. I was enjoying it and everything else. Just this uneasy feeling. And I'm right there with him. Because uh, every time I've been outside the country, it's usually going to a third world country on a missions trip. And you know what? I don't look very Haitian. And so when I go to, <laughs> you, you, you know what I mean? I, I go to different places and I know I stick out like a sore thumb. And I just, I just have this feeling. And anyway, uneasy. So I'm right there with him. And I'm thinking to myself, yeah, I, I get you. And he says, it's just, you know, everything was fine. Everything was going okay. But he just had this, you know, uh, just beneath the surface, uh, uneasy feeling. He and his family had gone to a restaurant. They'd ordered their food. They were waiting on the food to arrive. And he said, he couldn't help but notice about a, a, a table or two over. There was a family, they had, they'd already been at the restaurant, and their food was, you know, the waiter or the waitress brought the food and set it down the table. And just kind of out of the corner of his eye, he, he sees, you know, the food over there. And the family, before they ate, they all bowed their heads, and they started to pray together. And he said, you know what? I don't even know those people. But all of a sudden, this, it, it was like this, this warm feeling just washed over my, my soul. I felt like I'm away from home, but I'm home I've got, I've got brothers and sisters. I didn't even know who they were. Maybe one of the reasons this made such an impression on Daryl is because something happened earlier in his life. He said when he was a young man, I'm guessing from the way he describes it, early teenage, teenage years, first time he ever left the country. Why did he leave the country? Because when he was quite little, his parents had divorced. 
his dad was living overseas. And so uh, dad wanted to see Daryl. Hadn't seen Daryl, Daryl hadn't seen his dad in years, you know. And of course he wanted to see his dad, but his mother was quite apprehensive because, you know, it's one thing if you send a child to another state, but if you send a child overseas and all of a sudden dad decides he doesn't want to send the kid, you, you understand why she was apprehensive. Because of all that, Daryl's a little apprehensive too. He wants to see his dad, but he's like, well, I ever come home. Well, it, when he got off the plane, his dad was there to pick him up and, and uh, things were good. He still felt so uneasy. Uh, er, early teen years, in all likelihood. Why? Because he was already a Christian he prayed about this, but you know what? Still felt ill at ease. His dad, knowing that Daryl had become a Christian, made arrangements for him to go to a church. Very first Sunday he was there. So he went to a church, another country, didn't know any of these people, but in the middle of the service they stopped and everybody took a little piece of bread. Everybody took a cup with grape juice. And he said, for the first time in his life, it's like this peace washed over me. And I looked around and I realized I don't know any of these people, but they're my brothers and my sisters. I'm away from home, but I'm home. I'm home. That is the message of Christianity. Jesus didn't just die for you. He didn't just die for me. He died for us. He didn't just bring us individually into relationship with him. He brought us into his family. All of us. Folks, we've got brothers and sisters all over the planet. And today, right now, when we pause and we take a piece of bread and we take that cup and we remember what Jesus did for us, please remember there are people on the opposite side of the world who are taking a little piece of bread, a cup of juice, and remembering what Jesus did for them too. We're the same family. We're <coughs> brothers and sisters. Take some time meditate, pray. Remember what Jesus did for us. And remember your brothers and sisters around you. When you're ready, come to the table. I hope you took note of this as we were reading through these verses where it talks about the early church going, going not to Jews, only Jews, but also to the Gentiles. What did it take to get the church to go? Persecution. Persecution. Sometimes it takes great difficulties to get us back on track. There are many lessons in these short verses. There are three that I want us to start exploring over the next two weeks. We're just going to focus on the first one today, but here they are. If you're taking notes, persecution gets God's church to go. Persecution helps God's church grow. And persecution helps us as Christians know. There's few things in life that will really help you know yourself, your true motives, and what you really are like when things go south. We're going to save those last two till next week. I just want to focus on that very, that very first point. It's one of the major things that Jesus said. It's what he said in Matthew chapter 28 when he gave what we usually refer to as the Great Commission. He, he tells us to, to go. Well, before I can, before I can uh, uh, really deal with this and ask you to grapple with, with me mentally on this subject, first of all, we've got to deal with, a, with an undercurrent, an assumption that's a, that's a part of our culture, and we're going to be bombarded with this. And this assumption in the culture in which we live right now is this idea that you should not go. Let me give you an example of what I'm trying to talk about. The guy's name is Gene Allen Chow. He was from the Northwest. He went to, what, just two weeks ago, hired some fishermen to take him to the Sentinel Island between India and Southeast Asia. Did you catch this in the news? You know why he went there? The first reports I read, I'm kind of like, well, this guy must be mentally unstable, going to an island where, you know, uh, uh, everybody who's gone there before has been murdered and stuff like that. It wasn't until I read like the second or third article that I found out he went because he was a Christian. He wanted to tell some people who'd never heard about Jesus. He wanted to tell them about Jesus. What happened to him? He got on the, got on the beach. They shot him with arrows. Dead, right? You, you, did you read this story? This guy died. Well, there's been this flurry of different editorials and stuff like this that have been written, and even the, the, the uh, government of India has responded, and their, their basic point is, you know what? He shouldn't have gone. 
Leave those people alone. Listen, listen, it's a vivid example in the news right now of an undercurrent that's part of our culture. And this undercurrent that's, that, that's part of our culture is this. You can have your beliefs and you have your beliefs and let them have their beliefs. Just leave them alone. Who are you to mess with somebody else and tell them they need to believe something else? Listen, I, I'm so sorry. I want to go through this in a logical way, but emotionally I just can't do it. <laughs> If it were just you and me, that'd be something else. But if it's God, then that, doesn't that supersede everybody else's opinion? Okay, let me get back to the logical presentation here. Uh, one of the commentators I really like on the, on the book of Acts, you cannot deal with the book of Acts. You cannot be a commentator and, and, and try to explain the book of Acts without explaining the fact that God's people got this idea they're supposed to go. They're supposed to take the message everywhere. Listen, I'm sorry, another footnote. I just got back from a convention two weeks ago where 43 different countries were represented. And you know what? One, I mean several messages, but one message I got from every single nation that I had interacted with, and it's this. We are so glad you came to our nation. It is so much better because Christians went. It has always been that way. I'm, let me get back on track. <laughs> Here we go. There's a commentator who deals with this idea. And dealing with the book of Acts, you've got to deal with this, right? You've got to deal with the fact that, uh, that, that we go. But you also have to deal with this as Americans. There's this underlying assumption that we shouldn't do that. It's okay for you to have your beliefs, but don't mess with other people. And especially when you talk about other ethnic groups and other countries and, and other people around the world. Why, why in the world would you want to Americanize Americanize them. Isn't, isn't that arrogant of us to do that to other people groups across the world? Well, this one commentator makes reference to an African-American professor at Yale University just a few years ago. And this African-American professor at Yale University happens to be an expert on Africa, many different countries of Africa. And he was addressing this, this, very, this very point. This very objection that a lot of people, sometimes people just have this objection, but they don't verbalize it. But it's very much an undercurrent in our world. You know, we can have our beliefs, but don't, don't mess with the rest of the world. Leave them alone. Right? Why would we want to Americanize this? And first of all, he dealt with it. He deals with this so well. But he said, how naive. How naive. Number one, if you think we're Americanizing, then you're, you're thinking something. <laughs> Do you really think Christianity is an American thing? <laughs> You do know Christianity's been around a whole lot longer than America has. Okay, I, I, I understand that some people missed the boat on that one, but he goes a little bit deeper, right? It's not an American thing when you talk about taking the Christian message. And uh, by the way, I get it. Sometimes people, people are not just sharing their faith. They're, they are trying to change a culture and, and Americanize it. You know what? That's a whole different subject. What we're talking about is simply taking the news of Jesus there. Well, anyway, I, I want to come back to this professor at Yale, who's an expert on Africa. Here's what he said. He said, listen, if you really knew your history, and if you would just study a little bit, and you would understand Africa, here's a conclusion you would come to. Or he says, at least you would come to something close to this. Another underlying assumption that most people make on the international level, we can relate with one another as long as we only do it on a secular level. All faith and all belief, you kind of put that in the back seat. Let's not bring that up. Let's just deal with commerce. Let's, let's, let's deal, you know, international trade, international relationships. But you keep your faith. You keep the spiritual realm, even if you, if you believe in a spiritual realm. Keep that in the back seat. It's what, it, it, it's what here in America some people talk about when they, when they talk about separation of church and state. You talk about opening a can of worms. It's something that's so misunderstood, right? But people talk about that. It, basically what most people mean is this. It's okay for you to have your religious beliefs, your, spirit, your ideas about spirituality. Just keep them in the back seat. For us to be able to interact with, with, you know, so many different people in one culture, then we've got to leave the faith aside and just deal with each other on a secular level. Okay, back to this guy. I'm going to get there, okay? Back to this professor at Yale. He says, listen, if you have that assumption and you come to the continent of Africa and you only deal with them on a secular level, you have violated the very thing that you said you didn't want to violate. That is perverting their culture. Because if you understood anything about the many countries in Africa, you would understand this, that the spiritual realm is very much a part of their everyday life. They've always had strong beliefs about evil spiritual forces and positive spiritual forces in the spiritual realm. They cannot live a day-to-day -day life without bringing the spiritual realm into everyday life. And if you want to deal with them in your secular Western culture without faith, you have perverted them. 
Are you following what he says? This is perhaps why when the Christian message came to Africa in the year 1900, they guesstimated that there was approximately 8% Christianity of all the countries in Africa. In the year 2000, it had surpassed 50%. You talk, about, you talk about a part of the world that's just waiting to hear the message. Listen, I heard from, from samplings from 43 different countries, and it was the same message. This is, this, is, this is what we need. Okay, okay. So, so why aren't we always going? Sad fact. Sad fact. Most of the time, you get a raise... Life is good. Plan vacation. You're not on your knees thinking about who needs to hear about Jesus. But when you get the pink slip, when you had that terrible meeting with the doctor and heard news you didn't want to hear, when the relationship goes south and it shakes you to the core, you're a little more apt to go to your knees and start opening your Bible and asking questions, God, why am I here? And if you, if you with me would just ask that question, God, why am I here? I hope you hear the answer. All authority, the expert on heaven and earth says, here it is. Go make disciples. How, how do you bring people closer to Jesus? There's three major parts. You go, you baptize, you teach. You got to go. Why are we here? Open your eyes. There's people all around us. That's, that's why we're here. Listen, I, I, I want to tell you a couple of stories. I, I hope they are half as inspiring to you as, as, as they were to me. A guy's name's Ajay, Ajay Law. He's native of uh, India. He came over to the United States to go to Bible college. In fact, that's where I first met his nephews anyway. I used to babysit his nephews. I digress. Ajay Law, <laughs> Ajay Law is a minister. He's been working with a mission in central India. We support a mission in south India. The mission we support in south India, you, you read it in the bulletin, right? You realize as a congregation, we support, this, we support this mission greater than any other one congregation. They've started over a thousand churches in South India. Well, this is a story about Central India. In Central India, Ajay was talking about Punjab. Punjab is a, is, is a city located on the border between, between Afghanistan and India. It's away from where he lives, but he was invited to come up there to speak, to share the message of Jesus, because several, several other Christians had gone to that area. They had started sharing their faith and telling other people about Jesus. It, it's very, it's, it's very, a lot of Hindus, but also Islam is strong in that part of the world. So it's very difficult, very difficult. But they thought, hey, the time is right. We can advertise this. We can have a big open meeting. And a lot of times, you know, you have these big open air meetings. It's, it's a way to get something started. So they've made all their plans. The day before Ajay was supposed to go up there and speak at this open air meeting, the day before, the minister and his son, both of them were ministers in, in that area working on this uh, organizing this open air campaign. The minister, the father, was murdered. In fact, as he was telling us the story, they showed a picture of him laid out, covered with blood on the screen. Whoa. The guy was murdered. So Ajay calls the son and said, hey, you know, your dad was just murdered today. We're supposed to have this, appoint this meeting tomorrow. If we need to delay it, if we need to make some other arrangements, you just tell me whatever you need to do. I understand you need to bury your dad. And the son was adamant. We are not going to let Satan have a victory here. Reason things like this are happening is because we need to tell people about Jesus. You better come. Ajay said he went. When Ajay got there, he was met by the chief of police. Chief of police had hired 50 extra policemen to help keep control. And the chief of police is talking to Ajay, and he said ahead of time, I've only got 50 guys. There's no way we can control if things go south. Here's, here's what I want you to know, Ajay. You're, you're standing on stage. He says, don't run that way. Don't run that way. Why? Because there's a Buddhist temple over there. They'll just kill you. Don't run that way. It's an Islamic temple over that way. And don't run that way. Sheep temple that way. 
He says, if things go south and we can't control the crowd, turn around and run that way as fast as you can. And Ajay's like, okay. <laughs> so have you got this picture? Guy murdered the, the day before. The chief of police comes out with 50, 50 of his cops, right? Uh, crowd control and everything. He gives you that kind of warning. They went ahead with the service anyway. Things didn't get out of control. As a result of him preaching that night, 300 people were baptized into Christ. Wow. 300 people were baptized into Christ. Here's, yeah. Here, here, here's the thing that gets me so much though. They, they went, even though it looked like, man, maybe we shouldn't go. Maybe we'll lose our lives if we go. They went, they baptized. And you know what? After baptizing 300 people that night, they stayed. They left a lot of the people they've been training in their Bible college there. And they started six new churches on the border between India and Afghanistan that are there today. Started this past year, even in the midst of things going south. Here, here's, here's one of the other stories. So many stories. Here's one of the other stories he told. It wasn't in Punjab. It was another area where there was, there, there was some persecution going on. We usually don't hear about it unless it's a foreigner, an American, something like that. But I tell you what, Indian Christians are having their homes burnt. They're being kidnapped and some of them are being killed. Oh, I've got more stories. I'll save them for you later. But anyway, there was another area where some of this stuff was going on. It was really, really, really bad. Within two days... Ajay had two conversations with two of the Christians that were in his church, the church he served in that area of India. This is like the next town or two towns over. They were talking about the problem. Just talking about the fact persecution is taking place there. He didn't bring this up. Here's what the two individuals brought up. The first guy's a business owner and he says, you know what? Terrible. I've been praying about this. You know what? I think I need to move my business to that town. Did, did I explain this well enough? He's talking about the town where they were killing Christians, burning their homes, and things were going really bad. And this Christian in this town says, you know what I think I need to do? I think I need to move there. Why? Because obviously they need more Christians around. Within a day, like the very next day, he's talking to a doctor at the hospital that they have there. And the doctor, out of the blue, said, you know what? I've been thinking, I need to move my practice. I need to go there. They need more Christians there. Listen, just like the early church, they got it. You got to go before we can change the world. But when you go, the world is being changed. We're winning. <laughs> We're part of it. But you know what? You and I, we've got to have our eyes open to the places around us where, oh, wow, it's bad. You know what that means? probably means I ought to go there.